Oh. And we're live. We are, indeed. C- calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London, calling Rick Byer in Chicago. Well, I'm glad that the call went through to the right place. You know, <laughs> I always right. wonder if I call Chris Anderson in London, what if I get Ed Murrow or, you know, somebody else? Well, I would like that number if you do come up with Ed Murrow's number. <clears throat> I will I, let you, I will I let be, you know I bet to buy where his flat was, though. That was interesting. Well, welcome to History Happy Hour, and we'll wait a minute for people to uh, join us so we can get started, and please let us know that you're here and, and where you're watching from. And I just want to say, I, I hosted a um, Zoom for another author the other night, and Chris called me out on Facebook for <laughs> dressing better for that I just than, wanted to... than I do for History Happy Hour. So I wore the same shirt. You just, you know, you, you were building up there, getting points, yep. and then you blew it. I didn't wash it or anything. <laughs> I haven't washed it in a while. It just kind of lost the effect there. Kind of comes on and off for uh, for Zoom events. So, Chris, who do we have watching with us today? Oh, well, we have Margie again. And we're very happy to see you, Margie. I'm glad the sun came out for you because it hasn't come out in London. Uh, Duncan, uh, Deborah, John. Excellent. So, yes. Well, All our friends are coming back. Many of you are here, as we are each week, uh, Sunday at 4 p.m. on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages. And all of our broadcasts are also archived on the History Happy Hour webpage. So you can go back and look at all 27 hours so far and week 28 and counting. about to commence. And I'll make it official right now. Uh-oh. And the bar, the is, bar open. is open. So uh, the Civil War Battle of Antietam remains the bloodiest single day in American history. Um, some of the most savage fighting in that battle took place in a 24-acre cornfield owned by D.R. Miller, uh, which changed hands time and again over the battle. Uh, uh, one Confederate soldier called it the hottest place I ever saw on this earth or want to see thereafter. Uh, and joining us today to talk about the cornfield and its role in the Battle of Antietam is David Welker. And David's a professional historian and military analyst for the U.S. government. And he's the author of three books on the Civil War. I think three is correct so far, right? right. Yep. And frequently does battlefield tours, spends a lot of time on the battlefield. And he joins us from Virginia. David, most important question, what's your cocktail today for happy hour? So I am drinking uh, a a tumbler of USS Constellation rum. Uh, It's uh, rum that is uh, stored in the hold. It's uh, distilled and then stored in the hold of the USS Constellation in Baltimore Harbor. It's uh, the oldest or only remaining uh, sailing ship from the Civil War. And uh, you can tour it, and the rum's really good, so. So he's, he's that's a class act. I I I, I just have a beer. You just I, have a beer. <laughs> I can't go wrong with a good beer. I am lost. What do you got, Chris? Well, I have a, a fortified coffee, uh, but you might want to see that it's in my new um, my new coffee mug here. Yeah. Yep. Dad's army, stupid boy. Okay. I get that a lot from my wife and daughter, so I thought that was appropriate. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> David, before we start to, to quiz you here, uh, I'd like to uh, read an excerpt from Bruce Catton's book, Mr. Lincoln's Army, uh, part of his Army of the Potomac trilogy. And he describes this part of the battlefield that we're going to be talking about, and it does so in a description that I've always thought was very quite moving. Two quieter bits of woodland could not have been found in North America, and no one outside the immediate neighborhood had ever heard of them. But ever since then, because of what was to take place there, those two woodlots have had a grim, specialized fame and have been known in innumerable books and official records as the Westwood and the Eastwood, as if in all that countryside there were no other bits of woods that lay just east and west of a country road. And in the same way, there was a cornfield lying on the east side of the road between the two plots of trees, which ever since has simply been the cornfield, as if there had never been any other. 
And later, um, at the end of this chapter, Catton writes about the night before the battle as the soldiers grabbed some sleep. And while they slept, the lazy rain breeze drifted through the east wood and the west wood and cornfield and riffled over the copings of the stone bridge to the south, touching them for the last time before dead men made them famous. The flags were all furled and bugles stilled and the hot metal of the guns on the ridges had cooled and the army was asleep, tenting tonight on the old campground with never a song to cheer because the voices that might sing it were all stilled on this most crowded and lonely of fields. And whatever it might be that nerves men to die for a flag or a phrase or a man or an inexpressible dream was drowsing with them, ready to wake with the dawn. And I, for my money, some of the most haunting prose ever. And if you were didn't know a single thing about the Battle of Antietam, you would get from that that it was something extraordinary. Can you set the scene, David, a little bit by telling us, you know, what leads to this battle in 1862 and why it's an important one? Sure. It, it's it's an absolutely critical battle that often is overlooked in the wake of Gettysburg, which is obviously more famous and uh, be, better visited field. But Antietam and the campaign that led to it was absolutely critical. We often view the war from a post-war perspective. That is, we know how it ends. We know what battles are coming and uh, how the war will unfold. But in 1862, of course, they had no idea. They were amidst this war and it certainly didn't look as if the Union would, would win easily uh, or, or be guaranteed to win at that point. So Robert E. Lee is bringing the Army of Northern Virginia, the Confederate force, into Maryland with a variety of objectives. He wants to uh, pull the war out of Virginia, live off the farm uh, farmland in the north, uh, let the, the farmers in the south harvest their crops as we go toward the fall and the winter, um, and hopefully, at least he, there's a, a faint hope that they'll convince Maryland to, uh, to throw off the Union mantle and be free now to choose to join the Confederacy. But really the, the issue that uh, is, is driving the Confederacy North is a hope that Britain will join the war. Um, ministers, Confederate ministers in London have been, uh, been working round the clock to convince the Palmerston government uh, to and Parliament to approve risking British treasure on the side of the Confederacy. Britain, of course, is still the preeminent world power, and uh, the Confederacy is hoping to do what rebels of a generation before had done, that is, get a foreign power involved in the war to fundamentally change the nature of the conflict. And, and that's what, uh, what Lee is doing. He's been winning battles left and right, but the British response has been, well, anyone can win a battle when you're defending your home and your, your state. So show us that you're something special, that you're worth risking British lives and treasure for. Um, and of course, Britain's objective is not so much to stop the war, which is often cited in the press as the driver, or even to open up the reopen the flow of cotton from the south, both are important. But Britain strategically is hoping that this uh, that this war will pit the two nations against each other, and they'll spend their time fighting over westward expansion and freeing Britain to continue to rule the waves and, and be the world's major military and economic power. Uh, so that's British goals. But what the South needs is a win. They need a win in Northern Territory. And Lee had actually received permission to, uh, to engage in this, this campaign uh, back in May from President Davis. But Davis said the timing has to be right. It has to be at a time when, uh, when we're on the drive. It can't be seen as a measure of desperation. Well, after Second Manassas, uh, after that decisive victory, Union armies falling back into the defenses of Washington, utterly defeated. That's the time that uh, Lee decides to launch this uh, this campaign, and he's he knows there's going to be a major battle. 
He's hoping to fight it on, on his own terms. Uh, he's hoping it will take some time. And he's a bit surprised when George McClellan uh, commits an act that's that's utterly amazing. He takes this defeated army, the, the remains of John Pope's Army of Virginia, Union Army of Virginia, rebuilds it, merges it into his own Army of the Potomac, and then within about a week's time, takes that out on campaign and into Maryland. So um, when Lee enters Maryland, he's hoping to fight this battle. McClellan chases him and forces him into a difficult situation. Lee, by the, the end of the Battle of South Mountain on September 14, 1862, thinks he's lost. The campaign's over. Uh, he has been defeated. His forces are falling back. They're dispersed all over Maryland, and uh, his campaign plan is in utter disarray. And then Stonewall Jackson takes Harper's Ferry with barely a fight. And in that, Lee sees an opportunity for success. And he begins falling back and gathers his army around tiny Sharpsburg, Maryland, because it's the closest strategic position that he can find. And he's going to gamble all on a, a, a battle that will hopefully, for the South, defeat the Union Army and, uh, and set the stage for British intervention in the war. So, uh, David, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank you for mentioning that a generation earlier it had been rebels that were, you know. Um, uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No sorry. more editorial. <laughs> we're, we're, having, we're having problems with this. <laughs> um, but no, seriously. Um, I think it's, it's, I'm not speaking out of turn when I say that this battle has been written about before. Um, it's, it's, but, but what is it that drove you to, say, okay, well, there's something else I can say about this. And what caused you to decide to take this, well, as far as I know, very unique step of really micro-analyzing, not even the battle, but just that one specific part of the battle? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, certainly Antietam, uh, not as well written of as Gettysburg, uh, but, but maybe second place in the number of books and the thoroughness with which uh, some historians and military analysts have looked at this action. So it is a risk any time anybody takes on a, a major and well-understood, well-followed battle. What drove me to write this book really was, uh, is, as I took groups from work around uh, in various battlefields, I was doing research to dig deeper into the motivations of both sides. What were tactical decisions uh, what were driving those tactical decisions. I knew what they were, but I wanted to understand what made these leaders take these actions. And studying Antietam, the cornfield always frustrated me because uh, leaders uh, or historians tended to just gloss over this action, or they would oversimplify it. They would focus on the Iron Brigade, or they'd focus on uh, Hood's division and their counterattack, or they'd take one portion of it and never really put it into the context of why were they fighting in this cornfield at all? You know, what, what was it about this spot? It's, it's a field between uh, woodlots, as that beautiful Bruce Catton quote so cited. Uh, you know, there's nothing about it that says, oh, we've got to take in this cornfield or we should fight in this cornfield. Uh, so that's one of the drivers was really understanding this battle and finding that earlier descriptions of the actions uh, were not sufficient. They didn't go deep enough into, the, into the, the story. As I began researching that, it, it occurred to me that um, there was a bigger story here. It's not just unpacking the cornfield or explaining the back and forth action. It's understanding how that fits in what the action of the cornfield was. Um, and why it was, was fought there. So in the end, um, what I concluded was that the cornfield was never anybody's objective. Uh, G General Joe Hooker is the one who planned the First Corps' opening attack, uh, planned the Union Army's attack early on uh, September 17, 1862. And Hooker figured the cornfield into his action only so much as he was going to advance across it. You see that arrow number one sweeping south. 
his goal was march through that cornfield and get up on the Dunker Church Bridge. That's what he was fighting for, to break Lee's line on the far left. The cornfield was just supposed to be something that they would march through on their way to that objective, this small white Dunker Church. Uh, and so I wanted to understand, you know, how, how did that happen? How did they end up fighting for an intermediate objective that never really figured as uh, as an objective so that's what really drove me to it and then the more i got into it the more i wanted to understand why did antietam become america's bloodiest single day what was it about the way this battle was fought was it the plans was it the actions was it the terrain um what happened to make this america's bloodiest single day um, and that research led me to conclude that the cornfield was the uh, the costliest action, the turning point it was the opening action and the inability to uh, to take that intermediate objective made it the costliest piece of ground. Well, it was, I think it was, you said that it was a third of the casualties on either side are, are suffered in that field, right? That's right. Yeah, um, and, right. you know, and for, for folks listening who perhaps, you know, are more World War II focused, um, there are more casualties suffered on that single day at Antietam than there are U.S. casualties on D-Day. Uh, there are more casualties at the Battle of Antietam than the combined battlefield casualties of the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, and the Spanish-American War. So it, it, it's, boy, an intensity of brutality that's sort of unmatched. And even more than on 9-11. It, it, um, there's a lot of accounts about um, 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 how bloody this was. Um, uh, one person said, men, I cannot say fell, they were knocked out of the ranks by the dozen. Um, as you were, you know, one of the things that you do in your book uh, very effectively is you basically kind of get a, an almost granular approach. I mean, every, every kernel of corn, and not quite, but uh, <laughs> but uh, almost a minute by minute uh, during the heat of the battle of what's going on in the battlefield. Was there any particular account uh, that you found, whether it was one that had been used in other books or one that you turned up yourself that, that was particularly moving or informative or kind of presented a picture of the field that was you know, more intense than something else you'd seen? Yeah, there were a couple of accounts that in my research uh, that came up. But one of them is not as well known, certainly, as uh, Rufus Dawes' account of the, uh, the Iron Brigade, uh, 6th Wisconsin. But um, it, it, nonetheless, it's and that's a, a terrific account. One of the accounts that I liked a lot was by uh, Lieutenant Rush Cady of the 97th New York. Um, I was particularly taken by the opening brigade advance in this battle. Um, originally, the, the plan was to have five brigades attack. The bulk of two divisions move forward at once. That was Hooker's plan, uh, but it fell apart for a variety of reasons. And it ended up with Duryea's brigade, Union Brigade, being the only one to advance forward uh, into a salient that Jackson had placed south of the cornfield. And, and it's the accounts that come from uh, regiments in that brigade that I, I think are particularly striking because that was in some respects the closest to combat and the opening moment of the battle. And I'll read you uh, um, Rush Cady's account of some of the fighting. Um, he wrote, Stir Sherman was squatting down in the act of priming when hit by a solid shot, which nearly severed both legs at the knees and took off his right hand at the wrist, the same shot killing Dick Handley instantly, going completely through his body. Sherman's blood, flesh, and pieces of bone flew all over and in the faces of the boys who were next to him. He asked for a drink of water and then begged Alex to cut his throat. He was in such agony. And... You know, that, that sort of granularity, that brutality of, uh, of Civil War combat is, uh, you know, uh, you're not going to see that even in the movies. Um, and even if they did, it would just be too hard to, to show you 
several hours worth of, of that sort of action. Uh, and I, I think that is, um, that's a particularly notable account. Another one is uh, by a private in the 105th New York uh, who was on the opposite end. And the 97th was in the center of, uh, of Duryea's advance. The other uh, account was by a, uh, a private in the 105th New York, as I say, uh, John Whiteside, uh, who wrote his father a very detailed letter uh, about two days, if I remember correctly, after the battle. And it it's, had been unpublished, uh, and it's just a, a beautiful uh, account of what happened, as horrible as that is. And, and he wrote of the advance to the cornfield to give you a, a sense of a private's uh, perspective. He wrote, we advanced through this field, the enemy artillery opening on us, and did us very severe damage. Here Rufus Barnard of our company was struck with a shot, or, or shot with a solid shot, and his head blown from his body. But on we went, paying no attention to those who fell in our ranks, no more than if nothing had happened. And he goes on to describe his, his action, uh, the brigade falling back, what they did afterward, uh, uh, the field covered with dead and wounded and, and littered with uh, caissons and horses. So those kinds of accounts really bring this, uh, this action to life and allowed me to um, not only bring it to life by, by bringing their stories into the wider context of how this battle was fought and the, the general's decisions that we often hear a lot about, but it also allowed me to take those accounts and look in detail to compare them, uh, to look and say, gee, does this, does this account make sense? Because a letter like uh, Whiteside's written after the, a few days after the battle, it, it might well play up its role, but the farther you become disconnected from the action, the more likely it is that people are going to inflate their role or they're going to, you know, remember facts that that aren't real, and, and if it's a published account, of course, well, now they have a financial incentive to... Whatever do you mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, and, and that's that's one of the big challenges of using first-hand accounts, is you have to look not just at, all right, this guy was clearly there, that's all documented, and he wrote about this experience, but how likely is it that this is something that's been fabricated in, in part or substantially and how much can right. we believe it right so so about we're getting a request asking if you can be a little louder and i understand oh. that that may not be technically something you can do much about but if you can scooch up closer to your mic or sure or be a, develop your stage voice a little bit <laughs> um, all right but uh you know i think both chris and i have spent a lot of time talking to world war ii veterans probably a lot more time than you've spent talking to Civil War veterans. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, and that is, a, a, well, they can have great stories, and many of which are true, and, and sometimes are as astonishingly too true, and you discover later some story that you suspected wasn't true, and you find out it was, but it's always so much better to be closer to that day. So it's amazing that there are, you know, sources that are a day or two old after the battle. I mean, that's gold. And sources we're still finding. Uh, right or buried away in archives or wow. in somebody's attic or um, and one great thing about the internet is that people will share those stories or they're they're easily accessible where before you needed somebody to say oh have you heard there's a you know in the missouri historical society there's a great letter um now yeah. you can you can easily search and even if you have to go and physically look at the the original copy you still can more easily find it um and that that certainly helped that ability to make those connections uh just over the internet and then to go and dig in deeper in the research yeah well one of the things has always just amazed me um speaking about the first person accounts um is given the intensity of that fight or of many civil war battles the letters that are written the day after or a couple days after that are so moving and so coherent. Um, you would think just the shock of that experience. I, I don't know that I could compose some of the letters that, you know, you have in the book describing the fighting so soon after, you know, Yeah, and that that's exactly right. There are accounts and I've 
I've seen them. I haven't held the documents because they're um, some are in private collections. But um, there are accounts where men who were mortally wounded wrote their families uh, yeah. from the field, and their blood is on that crazy. letter. Uh, and, and it's it's simply amazing to think that that's what they would do. But that's you know those were their forms of text messaging. Right. You know, today you'd grab your phone if you were mortally wounded somewhere and you'd text your family. They grabbed a piece of paper and yeah. they knew that when somebody found it, they would drop it in the mail. It would yeah. it would be returned home. Well, I will say, though, that, you know, many, many years ago, I was the editor of a Civil War journal called Columbia and, and we would get a lot of letters. And I remember one letter. Um, I wish I could remember the, the name of the author now. Um, but he was writing home to his parents to describe the Battle of Gettysburg. And he said, you know, you know, dear mother and father, you've asked me about the great fight fought in Pennsylvania and my part in it. It was loud. Your loving son. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I guess to him, that about sums it up. Yeah. When sometimes you see where they won't include details because they want right. to spare their, their loved ones, uh, especially women. Um, the horrors of what they experienced. You know, right. It was an era when uh, m many moded, but in a different way than than today. And you know, you could express love for another man. It wasn't anything, you know, right. sexual. It was um, it was simply a feeling, an emotion that you had a great fondness. And these men had that same uh, sensibility. They were no harder emotionally than any of us are we're no softer than they are we just deal with it in a in a different, different way. way and yeah. i think a lot of them these accounts especially in Tetum, which is uh you know the post-battle accounts of the field just being littered yeah. with bodies and now you see the recently discovered um, isaac elliott map which shows the burials at Antietam. Uh, and I, in my blog, I just posted a, an analysis of the cornfield section of that map. And just looking at the map, you can see that the thesis of my book is essentially borne out graphically because the heaviest casualties, the burials of those men who were killed on the 17th, uh, it, it centers around the cornfield. David right. Miller's farm became a cemetery yep. within days of, of that battle. Um, the in the in the accounts that you have of the fighting uh, and sort of the the back and forth nature of it, one thing that I discovered, you know, that I hadn't really thought about, at least not in the Civil War, uh, was the importance played by um, regimental and brigade commanders, people whose names are not known to anyone except the most. Uh, ardent Civil War enthusiast. You know, we're, we're not at Lee and Jackson and Hooker and, and names that are even like vaguely familiar. Um, George Meade, you know, Hancock, we're down uh, with people. Uh, you mentioned Duryea, uh, other people that we don't know. Uh, and and that, that oftentimes the roles that they played were probably, even though they're not well known, probably critical in the battle. And one that stood out to me was a gentleman, I believe his name is William Christian. Um, uh, on the Union side. Can you tell him about us and about... Tell him. Tell us about him. Can you, if you can tell him about us, we are, we are in good shape. But if you can tell us about him, that would be awesome. Sure. It's History Happy Hour, folks. It's going to happen. Go. Right. And I'm the one drinking the rum. Yeah, right. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. So, so William Christian was uh, a man who, before the Civil War, you would have thought would be um, would have been a, a a terrific volunteer commander. There's always a lot of discussion about what makes a an officer or a soldier even um, rise through the ranks. What makes someone walk out of the volunteer world and become an excellent soldier? And there, there are certainly so many examples of that. And what makes regular Army, West Point educated uh, soldiers be failures? So that's a separate topic in itself. But William Christian was one of those who should have been uh, a model. He uh, had 
served in the Mexican War, uh, had come back from the Mexican War with credentials, although he didn't see combat, but he didn't tell anyone that. He organized the militia in Utica, New York, his hometown. Um, he led that militia, was their drill master for a number of years. And when the Civil War broke out, he requested permission from the governor of New York to raise a regiment, raised the 26th New York, uh, very successfully brought it to the field. And it seemed that that Christian was, uh, was a rising star. His regiment had some struggles early on. Their, their first action was a, a disaster, but that doesn't make Christian stand out at all. What really makes Christian stand out is what happened uh, at uh, Second Manassas and then again at Antietam. Uh, at Second Manassas, he stepped into brigade command when uh, Dulles Tower was wounded. And as, as Christians going forward, having been elevated from regimental to brigade command, suddenly he comes down with sunstroke. He decides he can't go forward with his men. He uh, is seen uh, under a tree with a surgeon attending to him, and uh, he's you know, out of action. Better they go forward without me than having me face. And to the battle, yeah, yeah, the papers, right? <laughs> you go, man. Yeah. Well, Good luck. And essentially, that's what happens. After that action is over and Tower's Brigade is driven back, um, having played a critical part in helping to defend Chin Ridge against Longstreet's advance, buying time for, for Pope's army to eventually retreat from Second Manassas, um, all of a sudden Christian makes a miraculous recovery. And he's seen riding him on his horse, waving the brigade flag and cheering his men on, his men. Uh, and he refers to them as such even though he hasn't led them into battle. Uh, so he assumes brigade command, uh, takes them up to Antietam. And as they go forward in, at Antietam, they are part of that opening advance. Now I mentioned earlier Duryea, uh, Duryea's brigade, uh, Christian's brigade was uh, the, the third brigade in Ricketts division. So in first opening attack, Ricketts division was going to attack uh, along the East Woods, heading toward the Dunker Church. Marching through the cornfield would be Duryea's Brigade and Hartz's Brigade. They were su to be supported initially by Christian until Hooker discovers that Jackson Sigley and these Confederate troops holding the south end of the cornfield are there. Then he changes the orders and has Christian's Brigade marching around the east side of the East Woods to attack the Confederate salient flank. So that's what Christian's Brigade was supposed to be. But they never actually got to that point. As Duryea was fighting, and Hartz's Brigade got into the, the fight shortly after them, uh, Christian's Brigade was marching around the eastern side of the East Woods, uh, you know, changing direction, stopping, dressing their line, running through the manual of arms. And the men thought, this is, this is crazy. Why are we doing this? <laughs> It's, you know, there's fighting going on. We don't know what we're supposed to do. Only the colonel does command in the brigade. But why are we doing the manual of arms? And it's fighting within, I mean, that they can see, right? I mean, no, it's, absolutely. It's, 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 over, it's right over there. It's not <laughs> yeah. two miles away. It's, it's right there. Right. They can see the fighting through the East Woods. Unlike today, when the, the East Woods is kind of choked with, um, with underbrush, in the 19th century, these woodlots were sort of like barns. The farmers kept cattle and, uh, and other animals in them, and so they ate this underbrush. So you could see through the, the trees in the East Woods, and you could see the fighting going on. They certainly could hear it. And periodically, a, an artillery shell was sailing over the East Woods and hitting the ground near them. Well, finally, when Hartz's brigade had replaced Duryea's brigade in the middle of the cornfield fighting alone. Hartz's men uh, had, had had it. And um, the, uh, the man who'd replaced Hartz's came over, begged Christian for, for help. And now Christian had no choice but to go into battle. And at that point he snapped. And he says something that was recorded as he'd always had a great fear of shelling and 
he walks away. He abandons his brigade in the midst of, of this action. And no one else has any idea what is going on. So now his brigade simply sits there waiting under fire while their commander walks away. Uh, and, and certainly had Christian's brigade gone forward, had they struck the Confederate uh, salient and flank, they would have hit Primble's brigade, which was entrenched but facing behind rock ledges, but but weakly entrenched and facing the wrong direction. So had they struck that flank, Christian's brigade might have uh, played a, a decisive role in this battle and changing the course of the Battle of Antietam. But Colonel Christian's cowardice, which is certainly what it was, uh, took them out of that and, and forced others to have to go forward and take his place. Well, you know, um, one of the things that, that I've noticed uh, in reading the book and having read about Antietam before is obviously uh, McClellan is, is sort of central to the story. Um, and one of the things that I find shocking or surprising, uh, given his reputation, is just how hands off he is. He's a micromanager until the shooting starts. And then he's like, I've got to go read the paper. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when situations like with Christian come up, uh, there's nobody actually guiding this now what is now the central critical point of the battle, right? It's, it's, uh, it's individual brigading uh, regimental officers that are stuck in this. But because McClellan does some things, um, I wanted to ask you about, you talk about McClellan's linear thinking as being kind of yeah. important to how this battle plays out the way it does. Can you um, maybe explain what you mean by his linear thinking and what that causes to happen, the, the effect of that, that method. Sure. Yeah, it, absolutely. And, you know, when, when people respond to uh, George McClellan, you, you get a lot of, um, of responses that say he had the slows, to quote Lincoln, or he was too cautious. He was afraid, uh, more afraid of losing than he was uh, willing to, to risk winning, or that there was some political game being played that McClellan wanted to be president and certainly there's some uh, something to all of those views. But I never really um, bought into the idea that McClellan was too cautious because here at Antietam, he's taken his army, put them on the other side of a major creek. Antietam Creek isn't a river in some places it might be, but certainly it's it's a deep uh, set of banks, steep, and, and the stream which can be forded in places uh, can't in most others and so those three bridges become critical choke points so if he's so cautious why would he put his entire army on the other side of a river thinking that you know lee was 10 feet tall with magical powers and would trap his army there a cautious general would let lee come to him and fight him there so i never liked that and as i began to struggle with it um I read an account uh, in a book that, that opened my eyes to the idea that McClellan's problem wasn't that he was afraid or cautious or political. It's that he was a linear thinker. Uh, he could get from point A to point P, B brilliantly. And as long as his plan could be executed as exactly as he wanted or with a minimum of changes, it was fine. It's why he was able to take the army within a week's time, rebuild it, reorganize it, uh, resupply it after a major defeat and take it out into the field. Because in Washington, with the proper authority, he could make all of those things happen. But battles don't unfold like bureaucratic exercises in peacetime. Now, that's, uh, and that's where McClellan falls down because that same ability that he had to get from point A to point B so doggedly, so thoroughly uh, and effectively, uh, he just couldn't do that in, in battle. Battle is an unfolding series of, um, uh, of events that require action and quick reaction. It requires an iterative thinker who can look at a situation and say, yeah, my plan's gone to pieces, but you know what? Opportunity right there and I'm gonna change the whole battle based on that. I'm going to make that become the focus of my 
my attack and my action. And so that I think is uh, is really uh, what's driving McClellan. He his linear plan is uh, I'm going to deal with these these unknowables or uh, events that are going to occur by planning thoroughly, by executing thoroughly, by overseeing this action. Uh, and and people often will criticize McClellan as being at, at his headquarters, you know, sipping uh, Clare and and smoking cigars with Fitz John Porter and watching it through the, the battle unfold through, uh, through a telescope. Well, McClellan believed that that was his, his place. He became the, uh, the glue that would hold this entire action together. And to do that, he's got to be back at his headquarters. So he assigned uh, Joseph Hooker command of not only his his own first corps but of the 12th corps and i think because mcclellan secretly knew that he was not that kind of think on your feet adaptive general and he believed that hooker and in some respects hooker was that that general uh and that's why he he put him in charge so that he could sit back at headquarters be the glue that would hold together this action so that when hooker's attack on the Confederate left from the Union right was successful. He could launch the attack on the opposite end of the flank. And then when Lee's force was thinned in the center, he could send that final main attack uh, from the middle bridge led by the US regulars on George Sykes. And that, that, was, that was his plan. Um, but it's the linear thinking then um, I think means when Joe Hooker was taken out of the action and when Edward Sumner replaced him, a man who uh, certainly has his own good qualities, but by that point had been been pretty much uh, beaten down by the repulse of Sedgwick's uh, division in the West Woods, and he lost control. Sumner at that point was not the man to, to take over, and now McClellan did a lot. Uh, and when confronted with this early in the afternoon when he rides onto the field and, and settles a dispute between Sumner and General Franklin, who wants to lead in the Sixth Corps, wants to attack, uh, McClellan listens to them. He tells Sumner to stand down on the Union right. He now is going to make, later say, make Burnside's attack on the opposite flank, the main, uh, main action. But really what he's doing is he's just going with his plan. Uh, no matter what happens, he's going to stick with the plan that he came up with because he he really can't see anything any other way. Uh, he, he apparently plan. hadn't heard Eisenhower's dictum that uh, oh, yeah. right that uh, the before the plan before the battle of plan is everything and after the plan is nothing. That's right. Uh, exactly is- right. And, and you know it's funny in, in the book I. When I started to research this, I thought, this is an interesting idea, but will it hold up? You know, Because if this is how this guy is, it doesn't just happen at Antietam. It's, it's going to yeah. happen in everything, how he approaches you know, every situation. Uh, and, and sure enough, as I began to dig deeper into McClellan's life, it became clear to me that, yes, this is how he approaches every situation. There's a there's a there's a story before the Civil War. Uh, McClellan is is tasked with trying to find a, a a a pass for the railroad through the mountains in I'm gonna say Washington, but I may be wrong. But yeah, up the, you know, and and he basically he determines in his own mind that no pass ex- can exist there, and therefore he won't listen to anybody else or send or or even go look. <laughs> That's right. Exactly and, right. He. He gets into a huge fight with uh, Governor Stevens, uh, Washington territorial governor, uh, appointed by Franklin Pierce, who will become a, uh, a division commander and be killed at the Battle of Chantilly. Mm. Uh, because of exactly that. McClellan has uh, talked to the Indians, and they've persuaded him there is no path. And so McClellan will not do, even when Governor Stevens orders him to do it, he doesn't bother because he's already made up his mind. There is no pass. I approached it reasonably. I asked the people who would know, which are, you know, the local Indian tribes. They all said, no, there's no pass. So I'm not even going to look. 
uh, and, and the other thing that I, I think illustrates this in and it's humorous is the way McClellan wooed his wife. Uh, he famously married Marilyn Marcy, uh, his commanding officer's at one point commanding officer's daughter. He had fallen in love with her, and uh, perhaps the only time he was ever rash in his life, he proposed to her before he had laid the groundwork for uh, for the proposal. And she was actually in love with A.P. Hill and turned him down. And McClellan initially was, he was devastated by it, but he went in and thought, well, okay, what did I do wrong? This is by... You know, because... But at least, I, at least in that case, he went back and said, "This is what I did wrong." Right? Yes, Go ahead. It, he was reflective, <laughs> and, and his approach to it was, "I didn't lay the groundwork. I jumped the gun. Right. I did something right. rash and emotional instead of approaching it logically and thoroughly." So then he starts and, lobbying her mother, doesn't he? Isn't that yes. isn't that his approach? <laughs> he starts lobbying. He he becomes her friend. He writes to, to Mary Ellen and says. You know, I, I understand how you feel. I want to be your friend. Um, and they continue to exchange letters. And he knows that her parents don't like A.P. Hill. Um, you know, A.P. Hill doesn't seem to have a lot of promise. And of course, the rumor is certainly true that he has a uh, uh, sexually transmitted disease he picked up probably in Mexico. So they don't particularly like him, even if Mary Ellen does. And McClellan goes about building support with her parents, with her sisters. He creates uh, opportunities to be with her to show that you know he's the good guy. Um, he organizes a, a train trip for them because at that point he's working. He's a vice president of a railroad, and so he can, can arrange these sorts of things and uh, you know approaches it logically. And and sure enough, he wins. It worked. <laughs> well, I, I think that we've proven that we're we're uh, able to improvise since I never expected we were going to get off into George McClellan wooing <laughs> his wife today. So, uh, and we're handling it. We're we're okay. It's we yeah. don't have to. But we, we we're going to go back for just a minute to William Christian because we did get a question from Nancy about that. What what happened to him? Was he court-martialed? You know, what was the ultimate result of that? Yeah, great great question. So. Uh, immediately after the battle, uh, his um, uh, his regimental commanders all got together and said, "We can't believe what just happened. You know, it, it's a miracle we weren't slaughtered, and and um, we need to, to do something." And so uh, they proposed approaching General Ricketts with the idea of making him aware of this. Well, Ricketts already knew exactly what had happened. Uh, the other men who um, had seen this action had reported it, and uh, so so Ricketts was well aware of it. He he uh, prepared charges, a court martial charge, and uh, Christian realized that he he was guilty, and so he just resigned his commission. He went home to Utica, um, and, and it's in fact his story is is rather sad from that point forward because although he's He's out of the army. He avoids a, a painful court martial. He bears the stain of, of this failure the rest of his life, uh, and he essentially goes insane. He would be seen putting a saddle on the railing of his front porch <laughs> and riding it and leading troops in battle. <laughs> to the, the the regiment's credit, after the war, uh, they they essentially forgave him. They were polite and kind to him. They would bring him to events and, uh, and pay him respect. Uh, but he ended up being put into the uh, Utica Insane Asylum and died there. So, wow. Go ahead. so my turn? Your turn. Your turn. All right. <laughs> well, I mean, um, David, I, I have thought for quite some time, um, and I've often been told I'm very wrong, um, but I think a case can be made uh, for Antietam being the turning point of the war, um, not Gettysburg, as, as often said. Um, and I'd just be curious to think, uh, you know, get your thoughts on that. And if you agree with me, of course, that's wonderful. But if not, you can tell me where <laughs> to get off. Um, but I do think, you know, given the consequences of that fight, um, for me, that's where 
it's pretty much that's it. Um, yeah. Anyway, I, I would like to get your thoughts on that, and and also, um, obviously, of the whole battle. Then it seems to me, as you spelled out really well in the book, that it's the cornfield that really is that's the fight, right? Yeah, yeah. So I I think you're you're absolutely right that Antietam was the strategic turning point uh, of Civil War. That before Antietam, as I described, there was this uh, essentially three prong approach on the uh, on the part of the Confederacy to to end the war with success and independence. Because after all, that's the Confederates' goal, and it doesn't really matter how they get there. If they defeat the Union Army, that's fine. If they uh, drag the Lincoln administration to the peace table by uh, raising the cost of the war or by it bringing the Europeans in, that's fine. doesn't matter as long as they're independent. The reason Antietam is that strategic turning point of the war is not so much what happens on the ground uh, militarily as what happens afterward. It was enough of a Union victory for Abraham Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation that fundamentally changed the nature of the Civil War. Um, on, on, the, on the federal side, it meant that no longer was it just a war to restore the Union as the way it was before. It was now a war to restore the Union in a different way. That is a, a nation free of slavery that, you know, wherever we're going with this, there will be no more slavery. We cannot go back to the way that we were before. We're not just putting down the rebellion. Now it's a war to free men. And that forever closes the door in Europe to intervention. Uh, although the Palmerston government and um, the British political elite certainly stand with the Confederacy, not for slavery, but they feel akin to them. They are, after all, the heirs of the British aristocracy that had moved mostly to the south rather than the north um, in leaving England. So they feel this affinity with them. And of course, as I mentioned, there's strategic reasons for wanting to do it. Um, but it, it's tremendously unpopular. Slavery is unpopular with the people of Britain. And they will not support a, a military involvement to uphold a slave owning power as opposed to freeing those slaves. So Lincoln forever closes that path to the South. There will be no Confederate Saratoga uh, that's going to change this war for the South's advantage. And, uh, and that's why I think, you know, Gettysburg, you can look at as militarily, yes, the, the North wins most of the battles from, from then on. And certainly the cavalry at, at Brandy Station had, um, had fought a draw, and then the, the cavalry action at Gettysburg is a victory for the Union. But, um, but it is, as much as Antietam was a stalemate militarily, it was a strategic victory that turned the war in our favor. Why the, confe why the cornfield so critical there is that because of McClellan's linear thinking, um, Wherever Hooker's plan gets bogged down, which is the cornfield, that's where the, the greatest fighting it's going to be. So instead of marching across the cornfield, Jackson's uh, tactical brilliance and the effectiveness of his subordinate commanders at both the division and the brigade level uh, made Hooker expend really two full core fighting to control first the intermediate objective of the cornfield then the intermediate objective of the East Woods uh, and the number of men that were expended in attaining those those intermediate objectives was simply so great that they, they, they bled the army to death and left it essentially nothing with which to, um, to pursue McClellan's lending a plan to success. So real quick, uh, before we let you go, um, uh, we talked a little bit about McClellan. The other general there is Robert E. Lee. Uh, uh, some people, you know, sort of the consensus history view, the same people who think that McClellan is overcautious say that Lee is uh, audacity itself and a riverboat gambler. Uh, uh, so what's your take uh, in 60 seconds on that and, and on whether, as Chris believes, that Lee is a very overrated general uh, who basically uh, kind of 
I won't say loses it for the South, but he uh, he kind of puts them. I'm going to dodge that lightning bolt now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you can you can deny that you said that. You can blame it on me. Yeah, I I think uh, Lee certainly is is gambling all. He's done it before, and he's doing it again. In the past, it's always turned out for him. In the case of Antietam, it, it fails. Um, he, he rolls the dice to. Uh, let the Union wear itself out by attacking its position. That's why um, they don't uh, they don't move, they don't attack, and the attacks that do occur. Uh, one of the things I bring out in the book is that most of the attacks that occur, whether it's Hood's Division's well-known attack or counterattack uh, or other smaller ones, uh, amount to essentially nothing because Lee isn't ready to attack. So uh, Hood's advance really serves no other purpose than to push the Federals back to gain ground and strategic depth for the Confederate position. Um, and then when Lee does finally plan to attack late in the day, uh, his army has been bled to pieces. There's nothing left of it to, to launch uh, the attack that he wants to make. And he, he makes a, uh, a vague effort to launched something by sending Stuart's cavalry and a cobbled together force that Jackson is supposed to lead to turn the extreme right of the, or the Union line. Uh, it, it fails miserably and is put down mostly by First Corps artillery. So, um, you know, it, it's a bold gamble by Lee. He is the opposite of McClellan. He's an iterative thinker who can find opportunity in the midst of disaster and chaos. Um, but in this case, it, it Utterly, utterly fails. As to whether Lee is overrated, um, <laughs> as, as a, I got your next book, program. David. <laughs> Everybody, lean in and listen. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, I, on some level, yes, he is because the ex, the expectations or the image, the myth of General Lee is so great that when you start boring down into the details, he, as a as a loser of the war, can't. Uh, but fail. On the other hand, I, I argue that that it's General Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia that keeps the Confederacy alive for maybe two years or more longer than it would have survived right. uh, if Beauregard or Johnston or um, either of the Johnston had been in charge. Uh, Robert E. Lee was a tremendously skillful commander who who kept the Confederacy alive when it was on the ropes and gave it hope to keep fighting, to keep struggling on. Uh, and, you know, that's that's Lee and his army. It's not Davis, no. not Richmond. It's well, by the end, army. he's become the army. Yeah, he's become the country. Well, and, and uh, we'll later in the season, we'll try to have a tag team wrestling match between <laughs> David Welker and Chris Anderson on this and uh, really look forward to that event. David Welker, uh, thank you so much for joining us today to discuss your book, The Cornfield and Tedum's Bloody Turning Point. And uh, it's been a really interesting and uh, uh, discussion and learning things about the Civil War, which is great that there's still new stuff for us to find out. Yep, Dave, and I just want to tell folks that uh, you know, check out the book. I promise you, this is the last word on the Battle of the Cornfield, and so <laughs> yes, it's I well. Think, I don't think anybody's going to be able to top that. So, well, thank you. So, David, thank you so much Thanks, for joining David. us. Rick and Chris, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Good, excellent. Take care. So, uh, Chris, I, uh, I, uh, for history. Well, I'll edit that all out of the podcast version. <laughs> For History Happens Around Us, uh, I found a Confederate memorial in a most unusual place. All right. Can you guess where? Uh, Chicago, perhaps? Uh, not only in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago. Oh, yeah. And I'm not talking about a small Confederate memorial, Chris. I'm talking about a real substantial one. It's wow. in the Oakwood Cemetery on top of a mound. Yes. Uh, you, you, well, you can't actually see the mound in this picture because we're on the mound, but uh, uh -huh. a mound that holds at least 4,000 uh, remains of 4,000 Confederate soldiers, possibly as many as 6,000. It's known as the Confederate Mound, I think, for fairly yeah, obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah. 
And the men buried here were POWs at Camp Douglas, a, a prisoner of war camp in Chicago. Some captured at Fort Donaldson, Shiloh, Chickamauga, places like that. Camp Douglas, like all Civil War POW camps, is a pretty harsh place. Uh, sort of, the, you know, Andersonville was not the only one. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the folks buried here are believed to have died of smallpox, and there are some Union soldiers here as well. It's said to be one of the uh, largest, if not the largest, mass grave in the United States. Really? And the monument was put up in 1893 when reconciliation was the order of the day. A yep. slightly, slightly different feeling than we have today about statues and monuments uh, from that time. Separate show. But there was one man quite outraged by this, Thomas Lowther, a pre-war resident of the South who had to flee because of his uh, anti-slavery views. So in 1896, he erected a cenotaph nearby. I had to look up a cenotaph to see what it is. It's <laughs> That's not usually what comes to mind. But yeah. it's, a, it's a marker that doesn't actually have any remains there. Um, ah, okay. um, but he erected a marble cenotaph nearby in honor of Southern abolitionists, Good for uh, him. unknown historic men, martyrs who had opposed slavery and disunion. And uh, uh, he says at the end, after 30 years waiting, uh, you know, erected by one of themselves and exiled abolitionists. So it's all there in the Oakwood Cemetery on the south side of Chicago, at least for now. <laughs> do, you, do, do you think he was a little bitter about having to spend exile in Illinois? I think he was. I think he was not bitter about that. Although Florida versus Illinois, I don't know what the issue is. But I think what he was really bitter about was this frickin' monster forty-foot uh, yeah. monument with a Confederate soldier on top and cannon and cannonballs and government approval and the whole thing. And I think. That was just a little bit much for Mr. Lowther. And there are those today who wish to tear this down and replace it with a statue of Ida B. Wells, the great uh, African-American journalist and activist from around the turn of the century, 100 years ago. Um, and she's buried in that cemetery. So they'd oh. like to see a big, a big uh, statue of her instead of uh, one honoring the Confederates there. As you say, a subject for a different show, <laughs> uh, perhaps in a different lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next week, Chris, we have a schedule change regarding uh, the show, so we're not we doing what we had originally planned to do. What are we doing? Well, you know, after we had the um, highly successful show about Easy Company. Um, highly successful. Highly successful. With the amazing yeah. Chris Anderson. That, that guest was incredible. He was um, one of the best. You were very sad and maudlin and said nobody ever talked about the ghost army. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, Rick, just this once. No, seriously. Uh, we got a lot of comments. Uh, we have gotten a lot of comments from people that would like to know more about the Ghost Army, uh, and there's no better person to do that than Rick. So uh, next week on History Happy Hour, Rick will be the guest, and we're going to grill Go him. Yes. Questions. And we're Papers. Gonna, we're going to suspend the uh, rule of that you have to drink every time the yes. Ghost Army is mentioned because otherwise we'll all be sloshed 15 minutes. At the start of the show, show, just take four or five shots and then just you're said, done. I'm going to do a chug and then yeah. we'll, be, we'll be good. All right. Well, anyway, uh, Chris, another great show, and uh, we'll see you here next week. Looking forward to it. Stay safe, everybody.